I think we're ready to get started. Um, so I just want to uh, welcome everyone uh, and thank you for joining us today. We have a uh, really wonderful panel discussion for you today with some uh, fantastic integrative uh, providers, integrative medicine providers, uh, who are going to be talking about a range of topics. Um, I am Dr. Eric Pfeiffer. I'm a physician and I'm the medical director for the Institute for Health and Healing uh, in San Francisco, which is a Sutter organization, Sutter Pacific Medical Foundation organization. Um, it's also called the IHH. And if you have questions about, uh, about us uh, at the Institute for Health and Healing, uh, you can find it on the Sutter website. Uh, and I'm going to move on from that because I want to get to our uh, fantastic speakers. Um, before we get started, I want to go over a few uh, housekeeping things. Uh, to help prepare for uh, today's discussion. Um, please note that the discussion today is for informational purposes. So uh, these are wonderful uh, clinicians and uh, physicians, and uh, but uh, they, are, they are providing you educational information today, and it's not intended to be a specific uh, treatment recommendation uh, for you personally. Um, everyone's situation is unique, and so we do ask that you uh, seek out professional advice uh, from uh, from your physician uh, if you have specific medical needs. Um, next, uh, we're going to review how to use the functions in the Zoom uh, to ask questions and get technical support from our team. Uh, it's an interactive panel. Uh, if you are watching uh, our presentation today, um, you won't be on camera, uh, but we, you, we do encourage you to participate in the lecture. Uh, so if you have questions uh, for the speaker or for our team, uh, click the Q&A icon uh, to type your questions. Uh, we have a team monitoring your questions. I'll, I'll receive the questions uh, and review them, and then I will then direct your questions at our panelists uh, during the Q&A session uh, at the end. Uh, please note that your responses are only visible to our team uh, for HIPAA compliance. Um, if you're having a hard time hearing or seeing anything during the talk, please refresh your screen uh, and check your internet settings or your connection. And if you need any additional help, use the Q&I icon and send a message to our team and they can, uh, they can try and help you uh, and troubleshoot. Uh, so now I would like to in, uh, introduce our first speaker, Dr. Datis Karazian, uh, who is going to open our panel with a 10-minute uh, talk about autoimmune disease. Uh, Dr. Uh, Datis Karazian, PhD, DC, is a Harvard Medical School trained and award-winning clinical research scientist. He's an academic professor and a world-renowned uh, functional medicine healthcare provider. Uh, he develops evidence-based models to treat autoimmune, neurologic, and unidentified chronic disease uh, with a non-pharmaceutical application. Uh, his clinical models of evidence-based medicine are used by several academic institutions and thousands of healthcare providers throughout the world. Dr. Karazian is an associate clinical professor at Loma Linda University School of Medicine. Uh, he has a private practice in San Diego, California, uh, where he consults with patients from all over the world who are seeking non-pharmaceutical uh, 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 applications for their illness. Um, his practice is focused on developing a personalized medical approach using diet, nutrition, and lifestyle. Uh, most of Dr. Karazian's patients are referrals from other healthcare providers who require his unique skills in dissecting the patient's case and implementing personalized strategic approaches. So let me turn it over to Dr. Karazian. Thank you so much, Eric. So I've been asked to talk about autoimmunity and try to simplify the concept. So for the for the most part, autoimmunity, the auto being self-immunity is when the immune system attacks a uh, person's own tissue proteins. And it really could be any tissue protein. Like the most common autoimmune diseases would be like your immune system attacking joints, such as rheumatoid arthritis, um, your immune system attacking your thyroid gland, being things like Hashimoto's that leads to hypothyroidism. So autoimmunity is really when the immune system starts to, you know, think your actual tissue proteins are foreign invaders as if it was a virus or pathogen. That's the basic concept of autoimmunity. And the way autoimmunity is diagnosed is antibodies to proteins of your own body. 
So, you know, you can have antibodies to the sheath, myelin sheath of your nerves. That'd be indication for things like multiple sclerosis. You can have antibodies to your glands, like your adrenal glands, and that can be diagnosed as Addison's disease. There are a lot of tissue proteins that have autoimmunity markers that still have not been identified. There's certain autoimmune diseases where we know there's autoimmunity there, but like, for example, Meniere's disease, where people get inner ear damage, they know the immune profiles, autoimmunity, but they haven't necessarily identified a specific protein antibody. So there are sometimes people that have mysterious illnesses that really may have autoimmunity. Now, in a clinical setting, you know, as practitioners evaluate chronic patients, one of the red flags for autoimmunity is nothing's worked. They've gone through one healthcare practitioner to the next, to the next, to the next, and they have all types of diverse symptoms. The autoantibody immune response can be to any different tissue causing specific symptoms. For example, if the antibodies are against the joints, then people will have joint pain and joint swelling. If the antibodies are against tissues, proteins of the brain, people could have brain fog, depression, um, all types of mood changes, brain fatigue issues. They could have antibodies against their muscles and have severe muscle aching. So the key feature of autoimmunity is that these antibodies that are, are starting to develop. So when we see patients that come in with very diverse clinical symptoms, like nothing really makes sense, doesn't fit a real clear category at times, um, there's a very strong chance that it's autoimmune. Now, when we look at autoimmunity, it's one of these diseases that no one has identified a cure for. So no one's been able to cure it. So it's one of these diseases that can go into remission. So remission meaning the symptoms are dramatically reduced, sometimes to the point where a person has no symptoms whatsoever. But for the most part, clinical success is really achieved by remission. And we know with autoimmunity, diet, nutrition, and lifestyle can play a big role in, in, in turning an autoimmune disease into remission. And... Um, you know, there's various variables and factors that are very individualized to each person, which makes a treatment plan uh, individualized for each person, and every person has different reactions. So, for example, you could have three different people with rheumatoid arthritis, and one person has severe reactions to gluten, and they have like a celiac disease gene type, and if they go gluten-free, that may help them. Another person with the same exact autoimmune disease may not have that. <laughs> But if they don't get enough sleep, that'll really flare up their autoimmunity as an individualized response. We can have a third person has autoimmunity and they have like a latent Epstein-Barr virus and like it's reactivated, their, their joint pain, you know, gets really, really bad. So when we look at healthcare, healthcare has overlooked autoimmune diseases uh, in the general population. The current statistics are, you know, eight to 20 <laughs> Visits uh, different different practitioners are, are typical for the diagnosis to be made of autoimmunity, and um, once once a person is diagnosed, there really isn't you know a generalized treatment approach. So when we look at like medicine and we look at research, when we look at things like randomized clinical trials that are done to approve a drug or some kind of treatment application, those types of models are used for like generalizable to the whole population. And then there's another field of medicine, which is individualized and personalized. And this is where autoimmunity, lifestyle, diet, nutrition applications really shine. So some diseases work really well with the generalizable model. Some diseases work really well with an individualized, personalized model. And autoimmunity is one of these uh, diseases or conditions where a personalized, individualized, unique set of triggers have to be identified to help with the attempt at not curing, but putting a person into remission. So that's like the big clinical picture. So as clinicians, when we see people that have like diverse symptoms, took a long time for them to get diagnosed, or maybe they haven't been diagnosed yet, they haven't really responded to anything significant dramatically with their treatment approaches. Um, they have good days and bad days. Some days are much worse. There's always a red flag for autoimmunity. Now, where they may have specific deficits or symptoms could be a clue of where um, some of these autoantibody may be, specific to condition, and this is where laboratory tests are done to, to confirm it. The other key point about autoimmunity is that autoimmunity has different stages. And there's a first stage of autoimmunity, which is called the silent stage. And the silent stage, this is where if a person's blood was drawn, antibodies could be identified to their own tissue proteins, but they don't have any symptoms yet. And some people refer to this as a silent autoimmunity. 
And then the second stage that typically progresses is what's called autoimmune reactivity. A person will have antibodies identified with blood testing, but they'll start to have symptoms, but their symptoms are not severe enough. There's not enough tissue destruction to be diagnosed with autoimmune disease. And then the third stage is where there's significant deterioration of uh, of the joint or tissue or whatever the end organ is where the immune reaction is taking place. So for example, someone has RA in stage one, they may just have antibodies, no symptoms, but studies show it's predictive. Over a period of so many years, they're start, going to start to develop symptoms. Stage two, they could have joint pain that comes and goes. Maybe something is triggered like foods or lifestyle changes. And some days their joints are really swollen over the body, but they don't have deformity of their hands yet. And they're not going to be diagnosed with RA yet. And then when they progress to the end stage, they'll have severe deformity, severe inflammation, and then they, they will most likely get the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. So those are the main principles of autoimmunity. And as a person progresses from these different stages, it may take five years, it may take 10 years to become you know, the patient that is mystery illness or diverse and patients confused, practitioners are confused. And uh, the other key thing is the healthcare model doesn't really endorse antibody screening for all types of conditions just because of the cost of it. So a lot of people are left misdiagnosed. And the last thing I want to mention is when you look at the feature of autoimmunity, like what triggers it, what's the onset? There seems to be like the perfect storm model where there's genes involved, susceptible genes, plus like a, an environmental trigger and stress, like the perfect storm of various factors that then turns on these genes that then brings on the autoimmune disease. And we, again, we don't know how to turn these genes off yet. No one has discovered how to do that, but you can't change the expression of the condition so it, their person's in remission. And this is where diet, nutrition, lifestyle interventions come in. So that was my attempt to do a 10-minute review of autoimmunity. And I guess that's it. <laughs> Excellent. So we'll, everyone will have time to uh, ask Dr. Karazian questions at the at the end, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll direct a lot of the questions towards him. So thank you, Dr. Karazian. <laughs> Um, okay, so next I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Vivian Chen. Uh, she is an expert on environmental toxins, and she's going to make some opening remarks. Um, Dr. Vivian Chen is a UK-trained medical doctor with 15 years of clinical experience. She is board certified in the UK in both internal medicine and family practice, and she now lives in California with her family and has ditched her prescription pad to instead help people address root causes. Uh, Dr. Chen's world turned upside down when her daughter was hospitalized soon after being born with symptoms that no doctor could figure out, uh, though uh, uh, through doing her own research, she was able to help her doc daughter recover. Um, she also realized that the many years of chronic fatigue, acne, and brain fog she had were due to environmental toxicity. That opened a world of root causes she had never considered before as a conventional medical doctor. When she moved to San Francisco, she made it her mission to help people reduce their toxin load uh, because she believes environmental toxins to be one of uh, important root cause not enough doctors think about. So uh, Dr. Chen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming to this uh, webinar, everybody. Um, so I, as you just heard, I have a very personal entry into this world of environmental toxins, and I never learned any of this at medical school. Um, we did learn, you know, if we ever broke a mercury sphig back in the days when it was still being used, that the whole ward had to be shut off and, you know, nobody could enter it. It was dangerous for everyone. And yet it was fine to put 50% put mercury into amalgams. Um, into people's mouths. Um, and in fact, that's that was my link. I had a lot of um, dental amalgams and I'm a poor de detoxifier and the combination of that um, led to my symptoms. And then I personally believe that that also led to my daughter's um, health issues. So she stopped feeding when she was just eight weeks old. Turned out she had this really rare form of cow's milk protein allergy. And I actually consider allergies to be kind of the same, the, a different side of the same coin to autoimmune. Um, it's basically the immune system being disrupted, being confused. And the key question is, why is it confused? And that was my pressing question when I was trying to help my daughter recover. She is now 14 and grown out of her allergies. And so I've made it my mission to share this really important topic that 
not enough doctors are talking about, uh, and I wish more conventional doctors would, would talk about it. Um, so what are toxins? Um, toxins are anything that can disrupt our biological processes in the body and cause harm. So um, if we kind of step back, that, that includes synthetic chemicals um, used in industrial processes to make our everyday products. So your things like phthalates in your personal care products, BPA in your canned drinks, your canned food, um, thermal receipts, PCB in your um, seafood fish. And then there's biological um, uh, toxins. So synthetic chemicals that cause harm are more kind of appropriately named toxicants. So that's the uh, correct term for them. And then the biological ones are toxins. So these are things like mycotoxins from mold, um, endotoxins from the gut, bacteria in the gut. Um, and if we just zoom in on the synthetic aspect, there's now over 80,000 chemicals that have been registered with the EPA in the US um, for use. And a few thousand of them are considered high frequency um, usage chemicals. So they are used, you're, you will come into contact with them multiple times a day. And only very few of them, um, a handful have been tested for human safety. Uh, and that's what was really shocking to me when I moved to America is that there is very little protection of consumers when it comes to chemicals that are used in our everyday products that we're all exposed to. And this is really um, ubiquitous. And um, people are shocked to learn that the CDC has been monitoring the levels of toxicants in Americans for a long time. And, you know, the data is out there, it's on the website, and yet doctors still don't know this. In 93% of Americans, um, have BPA in their body. So urine, blood, 98% um, of Americans have uh, phthalates. 97% have PFAS. So PFAS is a group of chemicals that we know are associated with nonstick cookware. Um, so those are known as forever chemicals because they stick around, they don't break down and they, they can last forever. Um, and that is actually one group of chemicals I'm particularly concerned about, especially when it comes to autoimmunity, um, because they stick around and there are a number of studies now linking them to autoimmunity as well. Um, and, but what really keeps me up at night though, is the study done by Environmental Working Group over 10 years ago now. Um, they, fa they found that um, babies born at birth, they took blood from the cords of the umbilical cords of babies, and they found 287 chemicals in the umbilical cord. Most of them were known neurotoxins, possible carcinogens. Um, and we know that as babies are developing, genes are being turned on and off. They are, you know, at the beck and call of our environment, basically. And so, you know, we have epigenetic studies showing that some of these toxicants at the particular window of time of exposure can turn on genes forever. Um, so that that is what really keeps me up at night. And you know, that's why I've made it my mission to, to spread this message wider so that you know pregnant women or even just anyone can help can reduce their exposure to reduce their overall toxic load. Um, because we, we do have, you know, when I first started talking about this, my conventional medical colleagues would roll their eyes at me and say, you know, that I was crazy. <laughs> um, but we do have studies and we have human studies now and they're, they're cohort studies. So they're not, you know, your randomized double blind placebo control trials. They're not the gold standard, but, you know, those would never win ethical approval anyway. So we only have cohort studies, but when you have multiple cohort studies showing the same correlation, you know, we really need to pay attention to this. And we have cohort studies showing people who are exposed to um, toxicants in the environment, either through work or where they live, 
to things like heavy metals, PCB in the environment, they have increased risks of autoimmune conditions. Um, so how does how can these environmental toxicants or toxins cause or contribute or play a part in autoimmunity? Um, this is my opinion, and this is an amalgamation of different studies I've read, but I believe that they some of them can act on the immune system and um, you know, and whether that's through oxidative stress. So think of oxidative stress as kind of rust. Um, it's a stress in the body that, you know, and that's why we need to take antioxidants from our diet because too much oxidative stress damage your cells um, and they can trigger the immune system to kind of fire up. Um, also, I believe the a lot of these toxicants are directly damaging the gut, the gut, gut microbiome, the gut lining, and that is a key, you know, one of the three key pillars that are broken in autoimmunity at the earlier stages. Um, and then, you know, I know Dr. Karazian talks about this a lot, but there's the neuroendocrine immune axis. So you know, our nervous system is in communication with our endocrine system, and that's in communication with our immune system. So the three are talking to each other all the time. And a lot of what I mentioned earlier, so things like BPA, phthalates, these are potent endocrine disruptors. So they're disrupting our endocrine system, the hormones, but that's also talking to your immune system. So that's now impacting your immune system as well. Um, and you know some of the key um, tox uh, toxicants that I've come across that can uh, have been associated with autoimmunity are heavy metals. So mercury, lead, arsenic, um, and then you've got your PFAS. I mentioned that earlier. So that's from your nonstick cookware. Um, anything that's uh, waterproof, so waterproof clothing, um, stain resistant carpeting or furniture, and then pesticides, pesticides, um, and then glyphosate, a big, big one, Roundup, everybody's spraying it right now on their lawn. Um, those can directly damage our gut microbiome as well. So um, I just want to leave everybody with like, if there was just three, I know environmental toxins is a very overwhelming topic. So when I first realized, you know, toxins could be playing a role in my health, in my daughter's health, I was just, you know, I almost felt like giving up right away because they're just so many. And so it's kind of like where to start. So if there's anybody who's listening, who's just starting out, number one would be to get rid of anything fragranced in your house. So your um, air fresheners, your perfume, uh, your scented body care products, um, because those often contain phthalates, potent endocrine disruptors. Um, and studies have shown that once you reduce your exposure to these chemicals, the body burden actually comes down very rapidly. So that it's, it's very, very important to know that there are things you can do to reduce your exposure. Um, and then number two is to filter your water. So drinking water in the US, um, the, the facilities are only required by law to monitor for 93 contaminants, and there's thousands of them. So filtering water is really important. And then uh, number three is to switch out your cookware. If you're still using nonstick Teflon coated cookware, please look for an alternative, something like cast iron, stainless steel would be much better choices. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Chen. That was a, that was a really uh, impactful talk. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so now I would like to introduce the final member of our panel, uh, Akil Palanasamy. Um, he's going to make some brief opening remarks about his approach to autoimmunity. Uh, Dr. Akil is a Harvard-trained physician and the author of a new book called The Tiger Protocol. I have a copy right here. And um, it offers uh, holistic strategies to help treat autoimmunity and chronic inflammation. Uh, he is an integrative physician at uh, the, the same institution I'm at, which is the Institute for Health and Healing. Uh, Dr. Akil is in Sacramento and I'm in uh, San Francisco. Uh, but uh, all of us here at the Institute for Health and Healing think of Dr. Akil as the Steph Curry 
uh, of our team. So, uh, so hopefully that since you're uh, in Sacramento, we'll just beat you guys. It's not a big deal for you. Um, he combines Western medicine with uh, effective holistic approaches uh, such as functional medicine and Ayurveda. So over to you, Dr. Akil. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Dr. Pfeiffer, for a kind introduction. Um, and I want to thank um, Dr. Karazian and uh, Dr. Chen, who are both experts in their field, for uh, joining today. Because my, my whole goal it was to help raise awareness about autoimmune disease and to uh, prepare for my uh, book, the research. I actually read thousands of studies about autoimmunity and uh, um, so the book includes 830 references. Um, and what I found was very much what Dr. Karazian said in his opening remarks is that there's a perfect storm of factors that have led to this explosion of autoimmunity. Uh, some diseases have gone up by 5,000% just in the last 50 years. And, you know, our genes don't really change that fast at all. Um, so it's all environmental. Um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, as Dr. Chen highlighted, I think toxins are the big, maybe the biggest uh, underrecognized factor. So I found these these five key factors that I want to briefly mention, and they comprise the Tiger acronym as part of the Tiger protocol. So the T is toxins, um, and in the book I review twenty different categories of toxins that are each uh, tied to immunity. Uh, but as Dr. Chen said, most of us don't have just one. You know, we have uh, dozens and probably hundreds of of these toxins, and uh, there's a synergistic effect um, between between them as well. So, um, <clears throat> but our body does have detox capacity, and so my goal is to. Uh, help strengthen that, you know, uh, improve your liver function, your digestive function, where toxins are eliminated, uh, making sure you're drinking plenty of water, um, and um, and then reducing your exposure <laughs> to toxins as well. So um, that's my approach with uh, toxins. And then the I is infections. Uh, that could include a wide variety like bacteria, viruses, fungi, mycobacteria, parasites, archaea. Um, and my approach in the book is uh, let's make your body inhospitable to infections. So um, by optimizing, for example, your uh, intestinal pH, that's a really big factor in um, uh, allowing overgrowth of candida or bad bacteria if your pH is not right in the intestine. Um, and that mostly relates to short chain fatty acids, which your good bacteria are su supposed to produce. So um, I think in Western medicine, you know, we focus a lot on the germ, like with germ theory and finding the right antibiotic. But I think we need to focus more on the terrain, like the environment of the body and making that inhospitable to infections. And then with G, that refers to gut. So of course, the gut microbiome affects every system in the body. 70% of your immune cells um, are in the gut. Um, and then the second most common uh, microbiome in the body is the oral microbiome. So all the dental bacteria, they actually play a big role in your digestion because digestion starts in the mouth. And then also in regulating inflammation, regulating your immune system. Um, so a lot of new research now about the role of the oral microbiome. So, um, so my approach is to optimize, you know, both the gut and the oral microbiome, because those are the two crucial uh, interfaces for how the immune system is programmed. Um, and then the E in tiger refers to eating. So this is my favorite topic. Uh, I think, you know, food is medicine. And uh, um, with this uh, eating approach, I've broken it down into two phases. There's the phase one diet, which is more of an elimination diet where you're um, avoiding potentially inflammatory foods like sugar, alcohol, gluten, perhaps, and a few others, and then adding a lot of uh, gut healing and detoxifying uh, foods as well, like your cruciferous vegetables. Uh, I'm a big fan of broccoli sprouts, um, your fermented foods, and bone broth. So it's really a healing um, diet, but also a temporary diet. And then after elimination, the reintroduction phase is very important. Um, and so that's my phase two diet. 
Um, so uh, in the book, I walk through like an eight week protocol for how to reintroduce foods, because I really believe that's critical in the long run. Um, the diversity of your diet determines the diversity of your microbiome. And we know that's the key factor for longevity, because uh, those over the age of 100 um, have generally very diverse microbiomes, much more so than other um, elders. And um, so that longevity is, is our goal. And it, it comes back to the, the microbiome and also eating a diverse diet with plenty of different types of uh, plant foods. Um, and then the final R in tiger is rest. And this refers to adequate sleep. Um, you know, we um, can't emphasize enough how it, that's critical. And then also addressing stress and the mind-body connection. And usually when I talk about this, you know, my patient's eyes glaze over and they kind of tune out. And um, so I think we've all heard a lot about stress, but I want to emphasize that, you know, meditation is not the only way and it's not for everyone. Other approaches have been proven to help uh, in autoimmune disease and chronic disease like um, counseling, psychotherapy, gratitude practices, prayer, forgiveness practices, yoga, tai chi. So find something that works for you. Um, and um, I'll just conclude with a, making a, a couple of points. One is that these same five root causes which drive autoimmunity, which can be addressed to help heal it, can also be used to help prevent it. Because um, we know autoimmune disease is a slow process that develops over 10, 20, um, 30 years. Uh, there was a study that showed that, um, for example, one autoimmune uh, liver disease called uh, primary biliary cirrhosis, the antibodies first showed up in the blood 25 years uh, before the disease was diagnosed. Um, <laughs> these are mostly military studies where they, they have blood samples uh, on everyone every year. Um, but it just shows that you know it's a slow process, and that's where these same five um, steps can help prevent autoimmune disease and prevent the progression of autoantibodies into autoimmune disease. Um, and then finally, I think that you know a lot of these factors are also important for obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Um, for example, with toxins, there are obesogens, which are known to promote obesity. Uh, many of the ones that Dr. Chen mentioned. There are diabetogens, which promote insulin resistance, promote diabetes. I think that's another reason why we have such an epidemic of diabetes. And finally, there are cardiovascular disruptors as well that impact heart disease, which is still the number one killer of people worldwide. So I think that these five factors are, are broadly relevant. Um, and uh, um, so, yeah, that was what I wanted to mention as an overview. So thank you, Dr. Pfeiffer. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, so now uh, I've got a number of questions that were submitted in advance, and um, I've got an idea um, in my head here about which of the panelists I want to direct some of these questions to. And then for some of the broad questions, I may just direct them to the entire panel and see if each of you have comments about some of these uh, topics. Uh, so the first one is for Dr. Karazian. Um, uh, can you reverse Hashimoto's and uh, the second part of the question says, do, do lower antibodies help with inflammation? I'm not exactly sure what's meant by that, but, um, and then uh, related, there was a question in the chat about ankylosing spondylitis. So if you have comments about either of those two illnesses, Hashimoto's or ankylosing spondylitis, I'd uh, appreciate it. Sure. So ankylosing spondylitis is considered in the immunology literature as autoimmune disease, but they haven't identified the target protein of the antibody. They have some initial ideas of what it is, but we don't have that clear diagnostic antibody marker um, for it. The Hashimoto's, reversing, reversing Hashimoto's. Can you do it? Well, it depends what you call reversal. Reversal of symptoms, um, but reversal of the autoimmune disease is unfortunately no. I mean, we haven't been able to figure out how to turn the switch off. Whoever discovers it is going to win the Nobel Prize in medicine. There are people who misinterpret remission as cure. Like, But however, once they have the same triggers exposed again, their symptoms all come back. So, you know, when, once someone identifies their specific mechanisms that help um, calm down their autoimmunity and go into remission, 
um, they want to stick to those. And, and, and it's going to be, and it can also change over time. It can be different, uh, uh, different factors at different parts of your life. Uh, you could have a severe, some people have severe reactions to chemicals that I just mentioned or toxic foods or um it could be lifestyle factors of stress can be triggered at different points in your life. So I really love the tiger article. I think it really covers everything and it's really a fantastic way to put it together. But um, as far as reversal goes, you can reverse symptoms in some patients, some patients, you, you know, they try everything and it's very hard to, to do anything for. So there's a, there's a level of spectrum that's not predictable, but most people uh, can see some improvements. So I don't know if that was too long of an answer, but that was an excellent answer. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so my next question is for Dr. Chen. Uh, Dr. Chen, uh, what is the impact of alcohol on autoimmune diseases and how dire are the consequences? Uh, I'm not a fan of alcohol, sorry. <laughs> if anyone loves alcohol. Um, I used to be a wine drinker, um, but I realized very quickly when I was trying to reduce my own toxic load that alcohol really interferes with your liver enzymes. Um, when it comes to detox, I mean, alcohol is a toxin that the body will and the liver will prioritize detoxifying. So it pushes everything to the back burner. So your other environmental toxicants is now going to be slowed down. Um, it can also affect your hormone health as well. It can impact your gut health, which is involved in detoxification. And gut health is closely, you know, it's a, it's a really important piece of the puzzle as Dr. Kiel just mentioned in development of autoimmune disease. So um, if you can be teetotal, I, that would be ideal, but you know, definitely drink in moderation. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, my next question is for Dr. Akil. Uh, Dr. Akil, what is the link between COVID, the COVID vaccine and autoimmune disorders? Oh, um, so COVID, you know, like any virus, um, any virus actually can contribute to autoimmunity. There are Epstein-Barr virus. And so COVID-19 is no different. So uh, there have been many published uh, reports about uh, autoimmune diseases that occurred after COVID-19 infection. Um, with the vaccine, I don't think we have as much data, but anecdotally, I've had some patients run into issues um, post-vaccine. But um, I think that um, also some of the research Dr. Karazian did uh, showed that uh, COVID-19 antibodies are cross-reactive with many different tissues in the body. So uh, unfortunately, that might contribute to this further uptick in autoimmunity um, in, the, um, in the years ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question about uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. I'll, I'll direct the question at Dr. Karazian, and then uh, if anybody else wants to make a comment about it, then, then you can. It basically just says, how does one overcome mitochondrial dysfunction? So with mitochondrial dysfunction, you know, the key thing is you have to activate what's called mitochondrial biogenesis, which is producing mitochondria. So there are certain plant chemicals that have been turned on chemical messengers to turn on the expression of what we call a proteomic response. So you can make more mitochondria. And those are typically flavonoids, really rich, colorful, you know, fruits and vegetables and those types of things like grapeseed, pine bar, pomegranate extract, you know, green tea. They don't make more mitochondria, but they turn on the cellular messenger to make that more efficient. But ultimately, if you want the most effective way to make mitochondria throughout your entire body, through all the different tissues and cells, it's actually movement. So most of the studies show any kind of exercise or physical activity or cognitive task yeah. it really turns on these messenger pathways for developing mitochondria. Now within a cell, there's only so much space for mitochondria, which produces energy uh, for your functions, your cellular functions. And we also have cells that these mitochondria cells that wear out over time. So as they, as they do their thing and make ATP and energy, they stay wear out and they need to be removed. And this is another process called mitophagy. Mitophagy is the clearing out of these unhealthy dysfunctional mitochondria. So that is equally as important when someone has mitochondrial dysfunctions. And the key things that impact mitophagy is really sleep. Like we go to sleep so we can shut down our system so we have energy to clear out these debris cells. So, you know, the very simple way to kind of look at this without getting too complicated is get a lot of diverse, rich, colorful flowers flavonoids, get exercise and movement, and make sure you get deep restful sleep. That's going to really turn on mitochondrial biogenesis to help make mitochondria. And then the sleep will help 
clear out all this unhealthy mitochondria. And the other thing that may be shown in some animal studies is uh, fasting. So fasting can turn on this autophagy process, but it's, you know, over probably two, three days in animal study shows that this can be very helpful as well. Because those are the main main points. Cool. That's a good answer. Um, okay. My next question I will direct at uh, Dr. Chen, but uh, if any of the other panelists want to make a comment, um, Dr. Chen, at at uh, what point uh, should someone consider a chelation therapy for uh, a, a toxin or a toxin exposure? Definitely not before you've worked on your detox pathways. So the the supporting the detox pathways is super important. So what I'm what I'm talking about is your liver detox phase one and phase two, your bile flow, your gut health. Your elimination, are you pooping every day? Are you drinking enough water and <laughs> peeing enough? Are you sweating? Are you moving your body? Those, those are the main ways the body kind of eliminates toxins. Now, what I have seen over the years is a lot of people just jump into these uh, these binders, supposedly bind onto toxins, um, and they're constipated. So a lot of them are charcoal-based binders and if you if you're constipated already and you take charcoal you're going to be even more constipated and what's happening is the toxins are just being reabsorbed in your gut so if you're not pooping you're not detoxifying and don't don't please don't take binders <laughs> you got to optimize gut health first you've got to be eliminating at least so pooping proper poops like <laughs> I don't want to go into the graphic details but mm. once or twice a day at least um and then chelation, I feel like, you know, it, it's definitely helpful and it needs to be done in a medical setting because you're mobilizing these um, oftentimes heavy metals, very toxic heavy metals from bound in tissue now into bloodstream where it can now go to the brain and important organs. And so um, going back to my point earlier about elimination, if you're chelating and now your body cannot get rid of these toxins because the elimination pathways are blocked, you can actually get side effects. And I've seen that happen a, a few times. So um, definitely be monitored. I know a lot of these chelating agents like DMSA, they can be purchased online. Please don't do that. <laughs> Go to your doctor and be monitored, please. Okay. I'm glad I asked you the question. Uh, okay. Um, uh, next question is for Dr. Akil. Uh, Dr. Akil, is uh, fibromyalgia an autoimmune disease, and can the tiger, tiger protocol be beneficial? Uh, yes, there is some data now showing that there's a autoimmune component to fibromyalgia. Um, it's uh, it's likely also other factors like you know, inflammation and stress, uh, but definitely there is an autoimmune component, and that's why there um, there are stud studies showing that low dose naltrexone can help um, fibromyalgia. So low dose naltrexone is a compounded medication used in very low dose in integrative medicine to help modulate the immune system and address autoimmunity, and it's shown efficacy in reducing the pain and the, the the symptoms of fibromyalgia. So I, I believe that the uh, TIGER protocol could be very helpful for someone struggling with fibromyalgia. Very good. Um, a quick follow-up question about the TIGER protocol. Uh, is the TIGER protocol different from the AIP protocol? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think that um, in terms of the diet component, um, I, the uh, the AIP is autoimmune paleo, um, and um, my elimination diet is quite similar to that, uh, except that um, I allow mung beans, which is a type of legume uh, in Ayurveda. Um, that's you know what I'm also trained in. It's considered the most easily digestible uh, legume. And then I also allow, uh, in even in the phase one diet, some gluten-free grains like you know white rice uh, and so forth, because I haven't found um, those two foods to be um, inflammatory. And so the phase one diet that I recommend is more broad, more inclusive than the AIP diet. And then my phase two diet, yeah, is definitely. Uh, more diverse because in the long run, you you ideally don't want to stay on the AIP diet for life. You want to use it as an elimination diet and then move on to reintroductions. Very good. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go back to Dr. Chen for this next question. So uh, Dr. Chen, uh, in your comments, you, you mentioned getting rid of 
uh, fragrances in the house, like air fresheners and things like that. And then you uh, you you mentioned specifically uh, filtering your water as two important interventions. What about interventions to help uh, reduce toxic exposure from food? Okay, yeah. Um, so this is sometimes I find this difficult because I don't know the audience I'm talking to and their financial status because you know obviously want to eat as much organic as possible but it's not um, financially possible for every I mean I don't eat 100% organic so what I do is I try to prioritize um, the foods that have been found to have the highest pesticide residue so the environmental working group uh, every year they publish the clean 15 and the dirty dozen and I don't love the word dirty um, when it comes to food I don't like Kind of putting food in that category but essentially dirty dozen is um the group of food that they found to have the highest pesticide residue so try to buy those organic so things like your berries um anything with thin skin um it's really difficult to wash pesticides off so berries especially raspberries blueberries you know blackberries strawberries are very very high in pesticide residues um, leafy greens, again, very difficult to wash it off. Um, so spinach, kale, prioritize getting those organic. And then um, things with have like thick peel, um, avocado, banana, I don't always buy organic and they're, they're on the clean 15 list um, by the EWG. So that, that would be um, kind of where to start. And then there's like a whole rabbit hole I can go on and on about <laughs> different you know, measures. Um, but one thing I would say about food is cans, canned food. So that um, studies have shown that you can really rapidly increase your body burden of BPA when you eat canned food, but it also comes out of your body very quickly. So you know, if you're eating it here and there is occasional, that's okay but try not to eat it every day or multiple times a day because then your exposure starts to, your, your body level starts to, to rise up. Um, so, yeah. Cool, very good. Okay, um, uh, Dr. Karazian, uh, there's a question here about, about um, sort of difficult to diagnose autoimmune uh, disease. And the question specifically uh, asks, uh, you know, how, do you, how can somebody make a diagnosis of autoimmunity in me especially if the doctors keep telling me my tests are negative. And, and you made specific mention in your comments about how many doctors and how many visits uh, somebody has to go to before they eventually get the diagnosis of autoimmunity. So can you comment about diagnostics and in, in autoimmunity and the complexity of it and give people tips? Sure. So there's um, there's tissue specific autoimmune and there's like systemic autoimmunity and systemic autoimmunity is typically falls along lupus guidelines. This really checks like anti-nuclear antibodies or DNA antibodies. And that kind of is the basic standard when people are uh, doing a screen for autoimmunity, but sometimes you have tissue, tissue specific autoimmunity that isn't associated with ANA antibodies, which are typically done in a workup when someone's screened for autoimmunity. And, and, and the only way to really know which ones to run is to really look at the symptoms. So if you see, for example, some Someone who is skinny, but they're diabetic and they're exercise eating well, that would be a clue that maybe they have type 1 diabetes. If someone has chronic gastrointestinal issues and they have a healthy diet, they may have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's or some type of intestinal autoimmunity. If someone has chronic progressive gastritis, they may have gas, you know, gastric autoimmunity or you know, antibodies to parietal cells or some of these symptoms. So it really takes you know, an astute diagnostic you know, workup of specifically where you may have symptoms to then check those antibodies for those tissues. There are some labs that do like general screens where they'll check uh, some brain antibodies and endocrine antibodies and joint antibodies and gut antibodies, all as a screening panel uh, to look at multiple organ tissue antibodies, but those are the that things typically done. Great, thank you. That's a good answer. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Akil. Um, we we've talked a lot about uh, toxins. Uh, we've talked uh, a fair amount about eating uh, and, you know, some of the mechanisms by which autoimmunity happens. What about the G in the TIGER protocol, uh, the gut microbiome? Um, can, you, uh, can you talk about ways uh, both through uh, 
eating and talk about prebiotics and probiotics and the importance of those in terms of creating a healthy uh, a healthy gut microbiome. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think that that is really foundational, for not only for autoimmune disease, but all chronic diseases to improve the microbiome. Um, and I, I think a combination of prebiotic foods and fermented foods, and also a very diverse plant based diet where you're getting wide variety of uh, different colored plants. Um, that's, that's really the best way to support the microbiome. And I feel like most people know about fermented foods like the uh, sauerkraut and kefir and, and kimchi, but less people know about the prebiotic foods. So that's why I tried to really focus on that in my book. Um, and uh, some of them are surprising. You know, I break them down by category, like uh, inulin rich foods, which could include like um, jicama and leeks. Um, and then there's galacto oligosaccharides, which are in Jerusalem artichoke. Um, there's polyphenols, which um, the uh, richest uh, actual source of, of them is clove powder. So just sprinkling a little bit of clove powder is a great way to boost your polyphenols. Um, and then there's resistant starch, you know, three different types of resistant starch. So I think just uh, learning about all these different categories, and then you don't have to eat all of them, but choosing what you tolerate, um, that's the best way to improve the microbiome. Right. Um for Dr. Krause and Dr. Akil and Dr. Chen, for all of you, uh, can you make comments about about gluten? There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of discussion about gluten sensitivity, and there's sections in the supermarket now that are gluten free sections, and a lot of people have a lot of questions about uh, is that really important, um, and and why so? So maybe maybe each of you can comment on that. So let's I can start. <laughs> Thanks. So gluten is definitely a protein that uh, is a trigger for many people with autoimmunity. And, you know, there's different theories of why gluten has become a uh, significant trigger. One of them is that uh, gluten itself is not, it's not genetically modified, but is hybridized. And there's even theories where it, it binds to pesticides and changes the protein structure, making it more antigenic. And uh, this is a process called haptonation. So haptonation is chemical binding to a protein that changes the structure and makes it more reactive. There's been studies done where they looked at um, the trend in gluten, you know, is gluten sensitivity real? Is there a trendy diagnosis of the numbers actually going up? There was a study they did at Warren Air Force Base where they looked at 10,000 soldiers and then they followed up the study uh, four years later and they were looking at the same age group population cohort and they found there was, there was a significant increase in gluten sensitivity that happened and it's not just due to the popularity of the diagnosis. Now, gluten has a very unique sequence of proteins. If you look at, the, if you look at any protein, they have an amino acid sequence. The amino acid sequence of gluten tends to cross react meaning they have the same the same protein structure with many tissue tissue proteins of our body so when we make antibodies against, against gluten gluten is shown to, shown to directly cross react with proteins in our joints proteins in our brain like cerebellar proteins even thyroid thyroid proteins and this is a process called molecular mimicry so for some for, you know, for some people, it's just very inflammatory because it's a, a newer protein that's uh, kind of changed over time. They call it in the actual immunology literature, they refer to it as modern wheat versus native wheat. So modern wheat is a new uh, structural protein differences in wheat. There's a five to ten percent different change in the gluten proteome as of today than compared to 30 years ago, and it seems to be very inflammatory. And the antibodies that people have if they react to it can also then bind to oral tissue proteins of that because of that amino acid similarity called molecular mimicry. Cool. Dr. Akil or yeah. Dr. Chen, do you want to <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll just add that, yeah, I think that there, it definitely is a spectrum. So on the one end with gluten sensitivity, you have celiac disease, but then you have what's called non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which could be mild or moderate. And that's more what I see with most autoimmune disease. Now people have you know, inflammation and they're sensitive, but not uh, fully celiac in, in that sense. So uh, it's- And I have that. <laughs> oh. I actually have- Dr. Chen, you want to comment about it? I, I think it's very real. I, I don't, you know, I'm- I was dismissed by by my own doctor because my I don't have celiac, but you know I did my own elimination diet, and uh, when I reintroduce it, I have symptoms, and I reproduce the same symptoms every time I eliminate and reintroduce. So 
I diagnosed myself. And then later on, I think now it's a lot more widely accepted that exists. Um, but yeah, I think there is still no, as far as I know, no reliable clinical diagnosis. Oh, sorry. No laboratory diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Akil, it seems like the like the the Tiger Protocol is very comprehensive and um, you know almost creates an opportunity for you know a small problem in multiple uh, of these axes that you've uh, that each axis and the you know, like a little bit of a toxin and a, and a little bit of a celiac issue and, you know, kind of a mm -hmm. little uh, dysbiosis where there's a bacterial overgrowth in the gut or uh, not quite the right bacteria uh, for, for optimal health. Um, so can you just uh, comment about that? Is that, is, was that the concept that you were going for when you created the Tiger Protocol and just uh, give us a, a feeling for uh, mm -hmm. why you think that's the most mm -hmm. important approach? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, mainly because this is what I have seen work in my own patients, you know, um, over the past uh, 20 years. Um, autoimmune disease is complex, and that's why just addressing one factor isn't as effective as addressing all of these drivers. Um, and uh, and I think that, um, you know, for different people, different um, uh, causes are more primary. So for one person, toxins might be like their big issue. For another person, it might be stress or childhood trauma. Um, so, but I think some attention to all five of those areas is where I've seen the best clinical results. Um, and so that's where I kind of formulated the protocol. Yeah. Well, uh, for all of the panelists, uh, and but we'll start with Dr. Akil. Um, uh, the, the, the book is really comprehensive. I, I, I said to you earlier, Dr. Akil, that, uh, that it's a lot, you mm -hmm. know, and, and so what would you say to a patient that said, this is overwhelming and I'm not sure I can do all of this stuff and, and think about mm -hmm. each one of these things. And I'll ask each of the panelists to think, yeah. of, to answer that question with respect to co complicated, mm -hmm. potentially complicated integrative medicine yes. protocols. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that that's the challenge because there is so much literature and so much research out there and, you know, we want to distill it into um, simple concepts. Uh, but um, I think that, uh, you know, I would just um, start wherever you are and do whatever is um, possible for you. You know, you don't have to uh, completely overhaul every single aspect of your life. I think just starting small um, and that's more sustainable and then making incremental progress is what I recommend. Cool. Dr. Chen, Dr. Krasi. Yeah, I'm um, with Dr. Kiel, just making small, small changes. Don't try to aim to, you know, clean out your entire cupboard of personal care products overnight. Uh, no, I didn't do that. And it's just, you know, it's impossible to do that. So, you know, as and when your shampoo runs out, go look for a better one. And, you know, when your toothpaste runs out, go look for a better one. Um, and just make one change at a time. That's what I would say. Just don't, don't try to do too many things. And I, I really want to stress how important stress is, right? Because when you're, you might be adding to that flight or flight response when you're in now in overwhelm and thinking, oh my God, like all these toxins are gonna kill me. <laughs> and like, I need to protect myself. What do I do? And now I see a, a, a new kind of um, trend where people are almost orthorexic. They're overly worried about their exposures now where they won't go out to eat with their friends. Mm -hmm. They will bring their own food in glass jars. It's just a little bit, you know, I feel like in, if you're in that state of fear, then your body also cannot heal. Um, so that's what I would add. Dr. Karazin, you want to bring us home? Sure. I would say, um, I think you should step it up. I think you should be aggressive. <laughs> I don't I don't think you should cookie cutter it because not everyone can respond. So I can tell you in the clinical practice, the first thing is, I don't know if you'll be able to put yourself in remission. I don't know. Like we know, no one knows. Everyone's going to be unique. So you, you want to be aggressive. So I agree with, you got to start with what you can tolerate, handle with the, as the other panelists have said. But there's a point of like, 
you really need to, you need to be active in making some change. You're not going to just take a probiotic and make some change. Not that anyone's saying that, but it's, it's really, it's really a complete uh, focus and lifestyle change. And I would say the best place to start, you already know what it is. So for some people, their major trigger when they get a flare up and they don't feel well is like they just don't sleep. For people, it's just bad relationships. For other people, they know if they go and have pizza and beer, they're not going to feel great for a while. Maybe it's gluten. <laughs> Maybe it's some of these reactive foods. So uh, I think it was just kind of like evaluate yourself and see what's really made you feel worse. You can get a good clue of where you should start. So do you do you start big with your patients and then and then tell them to kind of step it down over time, or is that your approach? My approach is, you know, for me, like when when I work with a patient, I always go the most motivated right when they start. Like they've they've. They made a decision to get some help. They made a decision to step it up. They made some amazing lifestyle. They're the highest level of motivation. If we kind of do things slowly that don't have any effect, they're going to lose hope. So I like to be, you know, not too aggressive. It's overwhelming, but try to figure out what the most I could do with, with, with the capacity they're willing to do and then see what the response is. And then, you know, maybe it's really aggressive with an autoimmune paleo diet or many foods at once. And then if they start to feel better, we'll back off. But I found like, if I slowly do things, sometimes I kind of lose their motivation, but at the same time, if you make it so aggressive, then you won't get compliance. So it's kind of that balance. Well, thank you. This has been a fantastic panel. We're up against the hour. So I just want to make, you know, one final comment about the Tiger Protocol. Um, it is a fantastic book. It is very well uh, written. It's uh, incredibly effectively referenced as well for those of you who want to really get into the science uh, behind all of the comments that the panelists made today. So uh, I just uh, want to just endorse it uh, wholeheartedly. Yeah, same here. Um, I really <laughs> think this is a, an amazing, amazing contribution to society. Well done, Dr. Dick oh, Akil. Thank you. Very well done. It's very good. Thank you. Thank you all. That means a lot. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone who uh, joined us today. I, I want to thank uh, Sutter Bay and the Valley Medical Foundations for their support of the event. Uh, you learned about health from an integrative perspective. And if you want to learn more about your own health through a connection uh, with the IHH, please visit the myhealthandhealing.org uh, website. So thank you. Thank you to the panelists. It was really uh, wonderful. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. And thanks to everybody who uh, joined us on online. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.